There was a famous comedian, American comedian, some of you might know, called Bill Hicks. Um, and when he wasn't popular, he used to tour the States on what he called his flying saucer tours, which meant that he was appearing in small towns across America in front of small groups of um, uh, strangely motivated people who thought they'd been interfered with by aliens. And over the last four years, as chair of the London Hydrogen Partnership, I felt slightly the same um, in that I started off four years ago talking to small groups of people who are obsessed about hydrogen and pleasingly over the last uh, uh, four years or so the numbers have grown but as I think I said when I last spoke to a group I do feel like the Tom Cruise of, uh, of hydrogen world it's, it's like being a Scientologist you know there are believers and non-believers and there's uh, a general sense of hostility and, and uh, apprehension about what hydrogen uh, means and in many ways what we're trying to do um, in London from a particularly my interest is from a, a hydrogen point of view, is to kind of uh, found a, a religion. Um, we do in the city have an existing transport religion, which is about our cars. We have our high priests, one of whom you had here this morning, I think, Quentin, and there's Clarkson and uh, the whole kind of Top Gear thing. We have great huge uh, oil companies who are coming, becoming more and more ingenious about finding their product and selling it to us in uh, in different ways and inventing uh, internal combustion engines which are more and more efficient and it's a massive religion for us um, even to the extent that you know we uh, the previous mayor introduced a congestion charge um, a sort of penal tax on cars coming into the city center which had a temporary effect but then people got used to it and um, a bit like smoking cigarettes they just decided to carry on driving anyway um, and uh, my interest in hydrogen dates back uh, quite some years now, but I'm particularly keen on it um, for a number of reasons, not least because if you can't beat them, uh, if you can't get people out of their cars, you might as well try and make the cars and the vehicles a bit more, um, uh, well, a lot more user-friendly. Um, but there are three sort of fundamental reasons why we're so keen on hydrogen in, in London and why we want to propel ourselves forward. And the, the first is that, and it might seem like a small thing, but it co constantly infuriates me that I'm being sold um, technology that's manufactured elsewhere in the world that we invented. Uh, whether it's computers or CAT scanners or all that kind of stuff, we're very good at inventing things in this country and then giving it away. The Americans commercialize it, the Japanese miniaturize it, and then they sell it back to us at inflated cost. Um, well, you know, the fuel cell was discovered here down in Wales by um, Grove, and it's about time we played our part, coming from a long way behind, in, uh, in reclaiming that technology. Secondly, it solves a problem for us. We are the most polluted city, um, one of the most polluted cities in Europe. I lived until recently just by the Marylebone Road, the most polluted um, uh, road in the whole of the European uh, Union. So it solves a problem for us there, and also particularly uh, noise. Um, but also there's this the main reason, really, the most important reason is, is why not? Why wouldn't we do it? Um, we've always in this country embraced the march of technology and in many ways you can't beat it. Um, you know, sail was beaten by steam that's now being beaten by, certainly in military sense, by nuclear. Uh, so in the same way the horse was outdone by the internal combustion engine and the internal combustion engine, nasty, smelly, horrible thing that goes wrong all the time, will be eventually superseded by the fuel cell. And um, uh, so we want to be in the forefront of that uh, development for all those reasons. And we've deployed a particular strategy here in London um, over the last four years or so um, uh, to prepare ourselves for this critical date of 2015 when apparently uh, the cars are going to become uh, much more widely available, and that is to try and make the technology real for people um, so that they can kick the tires, they don't need to be afraid of it, they can see it, feel it, drive it, travel in it, and so when eventually uh, mass consumption comes, um, um, they're in a position to do something about it. So you will have heard about our taxis, which during the games are five black taxis, which uh, ferried all sorts of people around, from uh, Rupert Murdoch and his wife to Arnold Schwarzenegger to uh, the owners of various newspapers. We used a promotional tool, performed incredibly well, and will be doing so during the, uh, uh, during the Paralympic Games. The bus route, we're the only city in Europe with a fully hydrogen uh, bus route, we're soon to have eight buses on it. Scooters are going on uh, trial quite soon, and hopefully, um, following meetings over the last two or three days, we'll be bringing some, uh, some vehicles um, 
uh, uh, vehicles for use with the police and other metropolitan uses, about 20 of those hopefully over the next uh, uh, couple of years. Allied to that, uh, we also want to prepare the city from a, um, a technical point of view. There is this chicken and egg problem that you will know about with hydrogen, that cars fuel fuel cars, which comes first. Um, uh, one won't come without the other. Well, we're committed to putting in a refueling network here. We've got uh, two refueling stations already, the third coming on stream quite soon, hopefully in central London. And then hopefully we'd like to aspire to another three or four on top of that, so that again, by the time we get to 2015, the cars can come without fear um, um, that they won't get any fuel. Um, and by doing, we hope, those simple things, we will put the, the UK in a position to start to be a consumer of uh, hydrogen in a big way, certainly hydrogen vehicles, which will therefore give international companies the confidence to come and invest here in the same way that um, OEMs have come and built other you know, internal combustion car manufacturing units here, uh, they'll do the same with fuel cell. The UK is actually now a net exporter of cars. Um, we don't own any, any of the companies anymore, but we do build and export uh, uh, more cars than we import. And uh, it would be great as a starting base to be in the same position um, uh, with fuel cell vehicles. But also, I think we have a huge amount to add in that we have a massive academic research base here in the capital, most notably at Imperial College, uh, looking at development of green technology, and in particular fuel cell and the generation of hydrogen, uh, which I think could benefit greatly from, uh, from the cars coming. So you will, I hope, see over the next four years, London doing more again to position itself to take advantage of what, you know, and in many ways politics is about taking a gamble, what we think will be um, uh, the way forward. We have also alongside had, and you might have heard about it earlier today, an electric vehicle, a pure battery vehicle uh, strategy, which I think has had mixed take up. I, I, you know, a lot of the technology is the same and we would encourage and have encouraged um, electric vehicles from OEMs at the same time, but there's some practical difficulties in London which mean that um, uh, we'll never get universal take up. We cannot guarantee that everybody will get a charging point every night. Um, and uh, there's a certain amount of range anxiety too that means that maybe the ultimate solution is a hydrogen hybrid uh, battery vehicle and that may come at some point in the future. Um, but either way, our view is that hydrogen is going to play a big part in that future, and so we want to be prepared from it from a, a transport point of view. Um, so as I say, hopefully you'll see those plans. But in order to get um, all those uh, people here, the manufacturers, all the rest of it, there's another big part of our infrastructure which we need to improve, and that is our um, airport. And I just want to talk a little bit about our, our proposals around the airport. Many of you, some of you might have traveled in, on Heathrow, in through Heathrow in the last couple of days, yes? Anybody use this? There's some fundamental problems with it, which you will have noticed if you have over the years, which is, is basically it's in the wrong place. Um, it's on the wrong side of town. The prevailing wind means all the planes have to land. You might have seen them today over a heavily populated area with all the noise and fumes all the rest of it that causes a problem. Um, it's hemmed in on each side by motorways and dual carriageways and suburbs, so expansion is limited. And whoever the idiot is who took the decision to put the terminal in the middle of the airfield, um, so the only access is through that tiny tunnel, um, hopefully was shot a long time ago. Um, and for all sorts of reasons, it's a, it's a disaster. Um, and nobody, since it was first uh, put in place after the war, um, nobody has had the courage to say, Do you know what, we should move it. But interestingly, lots of other cities have. So New York, um, moved to JFK, made LaGuardia a, a smaller airport. Paris, I think, has moved their major airport twice, actually. Dallas moved its airport. Oslo's moved it. Hong Kong decided to get rid of theirs and build a new one on an island. And with that in mind, um, you know, we revived, if you like, an idea, a forward-thinking idea from the 1960s about rather than deciding... Um, you know, uh, uh, to put your airport where legacy decides, where in an ideal world would you put your airport? You know, if you had free will to choose anywhere, where would it be? And if you do that, and if you, you know, draw the Venn diagrams, you want to operate 24 hours a day, so it needs to be away from urban areas, you've got a safety issue, so you need the landing and takeoff to be where it's clear, um, you want 
unlimited expansion land. You need the wind to be in the right direction so the thing is landing and taking off. You need to be convenient from a transport point of view. When you put all of that together, the answer, mad though it may seem, um, is to put the airport out in the middle of the sea. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the British, by total coincidence, um, have some expertise in doing this. We designed and built Hong Kong Airport in five years flat, two budget, in the middle of the sea. And our view in this uh, building, the mayor and I, is that we should be doing exactly the same thing here. That has all sorts of other implications for the city about shifting um, uh, the momentum, if you like, east which has other benefits. You know, we have a housing problem hemmed in by the M25. We can't really go any further west. We have acres of land east out along the estuary, all of which could benefit. We have HS1, the high-speed rail link, that threads its way not very far from where the airport would be. It'd be quite easy to put a spur in and bring a high-speed train straight into the capital in 15 or 20 minutes, just like other uh, cities do. All that we need is a bit of um, political courage and quite a lot of money. Um, but we know from talking to sovereign wealth funds and others around the world that uh, funding the thing might not be as difficult as, uh, as you would imagine. And why not? You know, here we are. We've just had this extraordinary two weeks. London now acknowledged as the financial capital of the world. Why wouldn't you want to own a fixed asset, an immovable fixed asset with lots of expansion land, um, the, the prime aviation hub for Western Europe? Why wouldn't you want to own that? Um, in the same way that the Spanish wanted to own... Uh, Heathrow, we think the Qataris, the Abu Dhabis, the Australian pension funds, wherever it might be, would want to own that piece of, uh, that very valuable piece of real estate. You never know. We might decide for once to own it ourselves, um, which would be an unusual departure for us, but nevertheless uh, welcome. So putting those uh, um, two together, and by the way, oh, this is one further thing as well, which I ought to say, which we're never really supposed to talk about, but I was reminded about of the other day. Um, about a month ago, it was the 40th anniversary of the Staines Air Disaster. Who's old enough to remember the Staines Air Disaster? No? Crikey. Yeah. Heathrow, BAA, all the rest of it. For some reason, they never talk about the Staines Air Disaster. Um, Staines Air Disaster was 40 years ago. An aircraft taking off from Heathrow got into difficulties, uh, crashed, uh, and fortunately, it crashed on the apron of a reservoir in Staines, all 183 people on board were killed. Um, pray God it never happens again, but it's only three years ago, if you remember, that that BA flight, remember, just made it in over the fence on, in, uh, in Heathrow, and we don't really talk about um, safety, but as somebody who lives under the flight path in North London and who represents all of central London on the London Assembly, every time I see one of those A380s going overhead, you know, I thank God for the... Uh, um, for the aviation engineers who built it and their integrity and fantastic, all the rest of it. But we saw in Paris with Concorde that sometimes things go wrong. Um, and you can guarantee, please God, it doesn't happen. But if something does go wrong, people will be asking, when can we do the Estuary Airport, not whether we can do it. So putting those two things together, a new airport, a new type of transportation um, in the city, um, we're starting, we hope, to build a picture of London as a city that is thinking a long way ahead and thinking innovatively about how people get here and how they get round here, um, how they travel in the city, because we firmly believe that we can try, we should try very hard, to reclaim our lead in transportation, a lead we used to have 100 years ago in transportation generally in the world, because in time that will... Um, uh, give us massive economic benefits, both in terms of manufacturing jobs and research and the rest of it, but also fundamentally, if we make it easier for people to get here and to get around, they'll be able to do all sorts of other business much better. I'm sorry that I can't um, uh, spend the rest of the afternoon with you. I understand you've had a fantastic uh, uh, conference so far this morning, and I do hope that even if your battery vehicle operators or other types of vehicle operators, no doubt there's somebody out there with some wind-operated vehicle. There's all sorts of great ideas out there. Uh, please do uh, join us, in the, particularly in the hydrogen religion. Um, the more of us there are, the more funding we will attract, the more enthusiasm we'll get uh, from the public. And once that happens, you can guarantee that the politicians up the river will suddenly decide that this is something they need to put their uh, effort behind. And we might finally um, solve the smog, noise, oil dependency, you know, carbon problem that London has.
Thank you very much.